The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, look. I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I was ordained in the Diocese of Atlanta in 1992. And in every diocese across the church, when candidates are in the process, they have to go before the standing committee, usually several times. And once at the very end for the standing committee's approval. In the Diocese of Atlanta, the standing committee had a favorite question that they asked all the candidates for ordination. And this was the question. What is your favorite heresy? What is your favorite heresy? I was reminded of this question as I grappled with this gospel the past week, because my favorite heresy or something that at least part of the church for some years has called a heresy is called universalism, that salvation is for everyone. And this parable in Matthew paints a different picture. This is one of a set of series of difficult parables in Matthew about the kingdom of God and salvation. May and Judy and Ed were with me on Tuesday in our Lectio Divina group and we wrestled with this gospel. I told them Matthew's gospel is often very harsh particularly towards the end. In this parable, the king is giving a wedding banquet for his son, but the invited guests decide not to come. So the king issues a new invitation to everyone who is within earshot, both the good and the bad, Matthew tells us. So the good and the bad from the main streets fill the wedding hall. We might interpret this as God inviting people into a new relationship with, through Jesus, with the first invitation list declining the offer. So then the gates are thrown wide open to everyone. But then a strange thing happens. 
the king enters the hall and sees a man who's not wearing a wedding robe. A wedding robe was the standard garment that was required for such an occasion. This is not at all surprising to me in this story because this man was just out in the street going about his business when he was invited to the wedding party. But it is important to Matthew's telling of this parable that this man was not properly prepared. So he's thrown out of the party into the darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. The question is, what is the wedding robe? What does it symbolize? What does the wedding robe really mean? What does it mean to us? As you might guess, the answers to this have varied widely through the ages. St. Augustine said that the wedding robe was love. Luther insisted that it had to be faith. And Calvin said it had to be both faith and works. Another interpretation of the wedding robe is that it signifies baptism. In the early church, when Matthew's gospel was written, deciding to be baptized was no light thing. It involved risking your life. It was illegal to be a Christian. It had to be done in secret. And the preparation for baptism was three years of learning what it meant to follow Christ. Like we spend three years in the ordination education nowadays. And when you were baptized and came up out of the waters, you were dressed in a new white baptismal robe. You were clothed with Christ. Baptism was a life-changing and life-risking event in those times. So it may be that Matthew was pointing us toward the commitment we make in baptism. But what about those who are not baptized? Here is where I am drawn back to my favorite heresy, universalism. Universalism says that in the end of time, all of humanity will be redeemed by God. All will be saved. Not one group going to heaven and another to the outer darkness with gnashing of teeth. While this belief is still heretical to some Christians, I am in good company with others who hold it. Origen, one of the great early church theologians, believed in universal salvation. So did Julian of Norwich and many of the great mystics of the church throughout the ages. In modern times, I look to people like Alan Jones, the previous dean of the cathedral in San Francisco, and Richard Rohr and Cynthia Bourgeau. After all, if we proclaim that all of humanity can't be redeemed by God, aren't we limiting God? For nothing is impossible with God. But even universalism, as I understand it, leaves room for human choice. God never forces us to choose life. God does not force us to love God and other humans. I believe that universal salvation is possible, and I fervently hope that at the end of time, all of creation, including all of humanity, will be redeemed. But I don't believe that God forces anyone to choose one way or the other. Did the man in the parable choose to come unprepared? If there is a hell, I believe that it is of our own making. One definition of hell is separation from God. God never chooses that for us, but we can choose to separate ourselves from God. 
Julian of Norwich, the wonderful 14th century mystic, had this to say. She said, it is God's work to love the hell out of us. It is God's work to love the hell out of us. God is always inviting us to the party. God is always calling us home. The doors are wide open. It's a standing invitation. But Matthew's gospel warns us that the time is short and the time to respond is now. Amen. <laughs>